Uh, well, I found myself in a, a very interesting position. I uh, turned out to be an anti-war GI. Uh, I became an anti-war activist in uniform, and uh, there were a lot of us. Uh, I was drafted in 1969, and uh, when I got to Vietnam, uh, my uh, my actual assignment was a bit redundant. I was a, a broadcaster, an army broadcaster, and when I got to Vietnam, uh, they they had too many <laughs> army broadcasters. Mm -hmm. So uh, I went into limbo for a while, and then uh, uh, wound up uh, at uh, Cameron Bay, uh, one of the most beautiful places on earth. I was truly uh, one of the most fortunate men in Vietnam. There's no question about it. I spent most of my time uh, right on the edge of the South China Sea. And uh, my my medical unit was an in-country convalescent center uh, called the Sixth Convalescent Center. Uh, other veterans who may be listening will know the, the significance of that. Uh, so I was very much in the rear. Uh, from time to time, the, the war sort of brushed up against us, but uh, we were certainly not in uh, a lot of combat. Uh, my connection to that was through our patients, uh, many of whom were uh, wounded, uh, particularly after the Cambodian incursion. Prior to that, most of our patients were malaria uh, patients, uh, other people with uh, you know more more typical um, medical problems. But after Cambodia, we received a steady flow of wounded people. Mm. And uh, then from time to time, uh, because I could communicate fairly well with uh, guys who were hurt, uh, they would put me on helicopters and I would uh, fly around and help get guys from one place to another. Mm. So that, that was pretty much my situation. I, uh, th there were, by the time I got to Vietnam, uh, a lot of the discipline had eroded and people had pretty much divided up into little gangs, you know, little groups. Oliver Stone gets that right in Platoon, by the way. Yeah. Um, the uh, Kubrick film is uh, sort of a run-up to that. It focuses on a Tet Offensive. Uh, I got there quite a bit after Tet, so my experience was very different. Mm -hmm. But you were, when you, I mean, that, that, that experience, what you've been discussing, that kind of shaped your, your view on war? Um, uh, you, well, without exaggeration, it shaped the kind of man I became. Mm -hmm. um, the, the one year that I spent in Vietnam was the single most important determining factor in my development as a human being. I'm not exaggerating this at all by any means. Uh, it shaped my politics, it shaped my uh, identity, my, my value system, and I think it's, that's very typical of people who get dropped into uh, a war zone. You know, I, I, I don't think I'm unique at all. And the fact that so many of us had turned against the war, of course, gave us special responsibilities because, on the one hand, uh, no no GI would ever take any action to put the life of another GI in danger. But on the other hand, we were uh, not with a program, uh, as it were. Yeah, and uh, yeah. that attitude by uh, 69, 70, you know, pretty widespread. Mm. Well, what what kind of led to this track of... Uh, I mean, you, you, you've researched the war extensively. You teach uh, the war as it's portrayed in popular uh, media. Uh, wh what do you think the significance of, of that exploration is? Well, I'm certain that a lot of it has to do, at least in its origin, with my own need to figure out what happened to me and to members of my generation in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any question about that. I used my... Uh, my, my GI Bill uh, for a, a master's degree at the University of Utah to try to investigate uh, what what had occurred. In addition to that, I also became very concerned about how film and television and uh, particularly politicians were uh, operating to produce the memory of the Vietnam War. Uh, and for me, the breakthrough in that regard was uh, Rambo, maybe Rambo 2, 
where the Vietnam combat veteran is sort of repositioned as a kind of World War II poser. And uh, I remember being very angry uh, about that because that was not our experience at all in Vietnam. So uh, I embarked upon an academic career that pretty much focused on the critical analysis of all Vietnam films, uh, Vietnam-related TV programs, even the memorial in D.C. and other uh, cultural forms, uh, theatrical mm -hmm. uh, presentations, artworks, uh, in an effort to try to get a handle on how the Vietnam War is going to be remembered. And I, uh, as a Vietnam vet, I have not only a professional interest in that, but also a, a very personal vested interest in how the sacrifice of my generation is going to be remembered as we move down the road. And we are moving down the road, by the way. We're, uh, we're moving into our 60s now. Mm. Well, I, rem I remember reading a quote from Kubrick. I think it was filtered through one of his collaborators. I'm not sure which one, but who, who said that uh, he did Full Metal Jacket kind of as a response to that Rambo-type movie. Uh, so I, I think a lot of people found it uh, distasteful, that film. Uh, yeah, I thought that uh, Rambo was uh, an obscenity, and uh, uh, in in more recent years, I've I've come to the conclusion that well, really, it's kind of campy, you know, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. especially that scene where he becomes one with the earth of Vietnam and emerges through the mud and the rain. Uh, I I have uh, students in class now who who simply laugh at that. And uh, and I think that's a good thing. You know, I think yeah. laughter is uh, is, uh, is is a real good thing. The uh, the thing that concerns me most about that kind of film is the the uh, tendency to co-opt uh, the uh, experience of Vietnam veterans. And and I think Rambo too uh, uh, attempts to do that you now in a uh, disrespectful way, frankly. Mm. Well, what do you think of the, the the initial kind of reaction in the creative community in, in Hollywood with the with the films that came out about the Vietnam War in the in, in the '60s, '70s? Well, you know, for a long time Hollywood pretty much ignored uh, mm -hmm. Vietnam and and actually ran away ran away from it. Uh, it uh, I I think it was a good ten years after the actual hostilities that the, the films. Uh, started to come, and uh, from an anthropological point of view, of course, that was predictable. You can't go through a kind of uh, crisis that our country went through and not have uh, major cultural forms like film take on the task of assigning meaning to it right. all. So eventually it was bound to happen. But, you know, even that PBS documentary series that everybody watches now, you know, there were a lot of very powerful figures in the country who tried to prevent PBS from developing that series. Uh, there, there was uh, there was a kind of silence uh, going on. Uh, one writer refers to that period of time as a kind of subclinical malaise. You know, uh, mm -hmm. during during which time uh, Vietnam veterans were uh, cautioned against even identifying ourselves. I I landed in New York City after I got out of the army. Couldn't find work. Couldn't find work. Until finally another vet said, well, you know, you really need to take the Army off your resume, uh, which I did, and I found work almost immediately. You know? Wow. And uh, and that was not an unusual set of circumstances. Yeah. It really wasn't. But the, uh, the, the development of this, uh, really now at this stage of the game, this, this wonderful uh, body of work, that uh, came out of Hollywood is, uh, I, I, I think, a testament to the real value of cinema. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people who uh, degrade uh, the Hollywood feature film. I'm not one of those people. I love Hollywood feature film. Uh, and the, the various interpretations of the Vietnam War, I think, are testimony to, to the great cultural value of feature mm -hmm. film in, in, in this culture, certainly Kubrick. I mean, Kubrick, this this contribution uh, is really one of the most important uh, contributions to the genre of combat film, quite apart from uh, the actual Vietnam experience, which, by the way, I think he gets right on. Really? 
Okay. Yeah. I, I definitely, uh, I definitely want to, I definitely want to cover that. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, you know, there, there had been Green Berets, Hearts and Minds, Apocalypse Now, Coming Home, The Deer Hunter, those kind of v- Vietnam themed films. Prior to Full Metal Jacket, what what uh, characteristics make Full Metal Jacket stand apart for you from those titles? Well, you know, I can remember being a young Vietnam War vet uh, going to see that film, and I, I was quite startled by it uh, because up until that time, uh, you know, some of the movies had really turned me off, keeping in mind, of course, I had something of an attitude problem coming back as uh, all veterans of all wars have. Uh, particularly in regard to Green Berets, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't know of one Vietnam War veteran who has any respect for that film at all. Uh, by by the time we all got to Vietnam, uh, John Wayne, I think, was regarded as uh, something of a buffoon. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I was very glad to see that uh, suggested in the wonderful character, character Joker. You know, I mean, <laughs> uh, Joker doing... Uh, John Wayne is one of the great things about that film, and the the uh, the, the thing that that I believe that that uh, Kubrick uh, captured was the the bizarre, twisted pseudo reality of the Vietnam War experience. I think he captured that. He got that. Uh, where uh, very smart people are dropped into a war zone, and they know that it's insane. They know that it's psychotic, in fact. And uh, what, what we get in that film are a number of reactions by, by very good, decent guys to the psychosis of the Vietnam War period. And it starts in basic training. Uh, the the uh, D'Onofrio character, that wonderful character, uh, who's Name I forget the character. Uh, you know, you know who I'm talking about. Is that Pyle? Pyle, yes, Private Pyle. <laughs> I mean, what an absolutely brilliant character that is. Yeah. Uh, the uh, he is culturally produced in basic training as a psychotic, and the problem is he blows away the wrong people. You know, uh, if they had dropped him into a combat zone, he. Could have be, he could have become a you know a recipient of a Congressional Medal of Honor, uh, but he just blows away, he blows away the wrong guy, you know his uh, drill sergeant at plus himself. Um, so the I mean for me the 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 underlying theme of that film is how how do you maintain uh, your sanity in an environment that is thoroughly psychotic and in an environment where death uh, really has very little meaning other than the fact that, well, you're dead. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, for me, Kubrick captures that perfectly in in that film. Well, but particularly in that in the, to focus on the first half because this is a movie with two distinct halves. Uh, it, it, that's commented on quite a bit. I mean, that transition from the basic training to the actual battlefield. Um, but to focus on that first half, I mean, they they are training you to to kill, mm-hmm. um, and it, that's what's very unique about that because that's the first time we've been taken inside that process. I, I think in that way. Well, I do believe that uh, some of the World War II combat films uh, gave the civilian population at least a taste of basic training, but it was all very sanitized, and of course it was all built around the idea that uh, everybody's with a program and that uh, these uh, young men are are being turned into very virile, masculine uh, warriors, you know? Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, and uh, Kubrick comes along and, and pretty much says, listen, that's nonsense. You know, that's that's not what boot camp is all about. And I can tell you from experience that was certainly not what my boot camp was all about. And it's also not just uh, learning how to kill people. It's learning how to stay alive. You know, you stay alive by killing other people. And then that becomes uh, very clear to you. Mm. Uh, what, so I, yeah, I, th- I think that uh, that that uh, portion of the film is really one of the one of the major contributions to reworking the genre of the combat film. I, I cannot imagine any combat film in the, the future, certainly the near future, 
uh, on a generational basis, uh, paying homage to <laughs> to basic training, uh, the way the uh, World War II combat uh, films did. I, I I think he's certainly left his mark on the genre. Mm. But you mentioned this, the kind of the pseudo reality of it, and this is another point that's always brought up about about Full Metal Jacket in that in that second part. Uh, obviously, uh, they shot in England. Uh, and they, they kind of brought Vietnam to England, mm -hmm. uh, and so a lot of people comment that it doesn't it doesn't quite look real. It, and and this is in keeping with several Kubrick films, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some element of unreality to it uh, that gives it this this special quality, but some people find it a distancing. Quality. Yeah, well, you know, I've heard that. I've heard that argument, and I've uh, interacted with people who take that position. But I have to tell you, from from my perspective, and of course, my my perspective is super saturated with the experience of the war itself in my own little corner. And I, you know, I'm not saying that that trumps everybody else's point of view, but it certainly is my point of view. And and the very fact that uh, the the film does have that quality for me, that's Vietnam. Mm -hmm. You know, that's Vietnam. In in a sense, uh, uh, Vietnam itself wasn't quite Vietnam, at, at least the way uh, we Americans experienced it. It always seemed weird, the whole thing. In fact, uh, I can remember several times uh, just sitting around with GIs. Uh, uh, one one guy would say to the other, "You know, this is really like a movie," and and uh, that was a very common. Uh, observation. So, so the the fact that uh, Kubrick uh, shot that film uh, from from that point of view, uh, I, I I think in a in a very odd way he captured it. You know, he mm -hmm. got it. If if he had been able to take his crew off to Southeast Asia and actually shoot it in Vietnam, it would have been a completely different movie. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But there's. But there's something that runs through all of Kubrick's films where he he doesn't tell you how to feel about something. And and a, a, as good as Platoon is, and, and Kubrick also thought it was very good. I mean, he even pointed out, you know, it does it does kind of program you into exactly how you should feel moment by moment. Uh, and Kubrick's films don't do that. They avoid that kind of trap. And I think that's why people resist people that do resist his films. Why they do. Because they're not used to kind of bringing themselves to a movie. Well, I think that's a very interesting observation. Yeah, and I, you know, I can imagine uh, audience members feeling that way, and perhaps even some critics uh, feeling that way. But, but I will tell you, uh, for me, it is uh, that that quality, that that so-called distancing quality that that he brings to bear in his cinematic work, that that allows me to uh, fulfill my need to experience anguish and despair. And that, mm -hmm. that is what I recall when even now, you know, many years later, and now I'm well into my 60s, when, when I sit and watch uh, Full Metal Jacket, I recall the anger and I recall the despair that uh, I and, uh, you know, many of my buddies felt uh, just by being there. And and for me, that's a great strength that uh, Kubert brings to the screen. It's also – tell me about the portrayal of combat in, in Full Metal Jacket because this isn't – I mean, most Vietnam movies, the, it's centered around kind of jungle combat. And this is this is different. Well, uh, you know, keep in mind, I was very much in the rear. I was a REMF. I don't know if you – know that term, R-E-M-F, you can imagine what the M-F stands for, and the R-E stands for rear echelon. Mm. So any uh, any any Vietnam uh, combat that who was listening to this just got a chuckle, all right? <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, I brushed up against the war uh, from time to time, uh, but uh, by the grace of God, uh, you know, I, I was not a grunt. Uh, the, the, one of the things that makes uh, Full Metal Jacket unique is that it focuses on the Tet Offensive and particularly the fighting at Way. And the fighting at Way was truly unique in that war. Uh, most of the war had to do with uh, uh, you know small groups uh, out in the out in the uh, bush humping 
and uh, encountering other small groups. Way was completely different. Way was the closest thing that our troops uh, experienced in Vietnam to the kind of fighting that characterized World War II, where you go house to house and it's uh, up close and personal. And uh, so that's another quality that makes it, makes this film unique. And uh, what that does, of course, is open up all kinds of uh, possibilities for uh, characters to get wasted, for them to uh, uh, blow away uh, other people uh, up close and personal. The, the killing of the sniper, for, for example, who turns out to be female, is uh, pretty much unprecedented in any of the films made about Vietnam. Um, does that get at what you're... No, that, that does. That does. Uh, I, I may have it. trailed away from it. No, I, I, I have some re reading material here that I haven't delved into yet. I just I just picked some stuff up. But there's a lot of conversation about its portrayal of masculinity. Do you, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, one of one of my favorite, ca you know, I love uh, most of the characters who turn up in that film. I really do because, frankly, they remind me of guys that I knew in in Nam. Uh, Raptor Man, you know, the uh, the guy who just can't wait uh, to get out in the boonies and uh, become a man. Uh, and 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 of course, anybody who's been to a combat zone knows that that's insane. You know, it's utterly insane. Um, and uh, the, I, I will tell you my my uh, favorite character in that film, and I would have to say at this stage of the game, my favorite character in all of the Vietnam War films uh, so far is uh, Animal Mother. Mm. Uh, I, I think Animal Mother is is one of the finest uh, contributions to the genre that uh, any of the filmmakers uh, have, have made in reference to Vietnam. And for me, it comes down to one quote. Better you than me. Mm. Uh, Animal Mother is a fine soldier. He is an excellent soldier. Um, but uh, he understands that war is not a romantic adventure. It has nothing to do with the achievement of masculinity. It has everything to do with whether or not you're still breathing uh, at the end of the day. And mm -hmm. uh, for me, that is that is a powerful anti-war statement. Uh, I I think you know you know the scene that I'm talking about, right? Where the, yes. uh, the camera focuses on uh, individual soldiers, and, and uh, each individual gets to say something in reference to the war debt. That's what he says. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I I think that it would be absolutely impossible for a filmmaker to come along ever again and romanticize war um, in the traditional World War II way, uh, having seen uh, that scene and having heard that statement by uh, this, this wonderful character. Well, I'm, gl I'm, glad you, I'm glad you brought up that quote because uh, especially in those interviews, um, that they that they present in the movie uh, uh, to, uh, to bring up kind of the counter argument. A lot of people view his his dialogue and and particularly in those moments as being banal. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing banal about him. Uh, he yeah. he is a very complex character. In fact, I have suggested to students over the years that Animal Mother is uh, probably a uh, a literature student, uh, probably from some place like Dartmouth. Uh, he is certainly linguistically uh, gifted, uh, very intelligent guy, and uh, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if he is the guy packing around uh, a copy of uh, Graham Greene's book, you know, and probably reads it on a, on a regular basis. All that linguistic play that uh, he enters into with Joker uh, is... Uh, I mean that that's very intelligent communication that's going on uh, uh between those two characters and uh, that is carried on throughout the entire throughout the entire film um I uh, I I think that uh, animal mother is is uh, really one of the most important figures in the combat genre There's also the uh, a common theme that kind of runs along all of Kubrick's films and that's the the kind of the nature of duality 
uh, and it's pretty literal in Full Metal Jacket with with the Modine's character, with the oh, yeah? the, the piece and the uh, and the Born to Kill uh, emblems. Yeah. Uh, There's kind of contradictory <laughs> impulses. Yeah, but see, you know, let me point out something to you. Is yeah, I've you know, I've read that about uh, Kubrick as well, and I buy that. You know, I buy I buy into that argument. There does seem to be that theme uh, throughout his uh, throughout his body of work. But that was particularly true of our lived social experience in Vietnam. On the, on the one hand, uh, we uh, tried to be good soldiers, and in, and in fact, we were we were good soldiers. But on the other hand, we knew that the the whole thing was false and phony, and uh, that uh, the death and suffering couldn't possibly ju- be justified by any uh, set of traditional American values. We got that. We understood that, and that was the basis of the the weirdness of the Vietnam War experience. Uh, one of the things I like very much about the Joker uh, character. Uh, as well as Animal Mother and some of the others as well, is that they constantly comment on that. You know, they make mm-hmm. reference uh, to the the uh, crazy environment in in which they have been dropped. It's it's crazy not only because it's combat. Combat's always crazy, but it's crazy because the combat cannot be justified uh, by by any stretch of the imagination. And they get that. The characters get that, as we got it. In, in Vietnam, uh, the, I, I guarantee you, uh, the vast majority of American soldiers understood that duality uh, because we lived it. Yeah. And what do you think of the the, the closing of, of the film? Uh, because after after this kind of horrific death of the, of the female sniper, uh, which I understand was going to be more horrific uh, in, the, in the script form, it was supposed to be even more horrific. Uh, but the, they they close out the film with the Mickey Mouse song. I love that scene, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I I know many many people who don't. I know many uh, Vietnam veterans who who despise that scene because they feel that it's uh, disparaging uh, to their uh, experience. But for me, uh, that that scene functions as a message. To the civilian population, uh, the people who, who uh, by the grace of God, did not make it to Vietnam, as if to say, "You're responsible for this." And uh, you see how we take uh, the songs that we learned as children and we bring them into this horrific environment. So for me, that's like the exclamation point uh, for for that film. Mm. Uh, I, I, I think people feel very uneasy. I certainly feel uneasy when I see that scene. Years years later, you know, here I am in my 60s, I still feel creepy uh, when I uh, see that scene and hear uh, that particular song sung by guys who are out there with weapons and they're looking for people to kill. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think it's good to feel creepy. In, in that instance, I truly do, and I think it's especially good for the civilian population to to feel uneasy uh, about that because we send guys like that to do our dirty work generation unto generation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I tell me about your students and their reaction to the film because you you, you show the film in, in its entirety to them, don't you? Yeah, I did. I do. Well, initially, uh, when I began teaching this course, I got a <laughs> God love them. I got a lot of guys uh, in uh, the class who thought that it was going to be a rah rah, you know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, heroic effort, and uh, it, it was simply going to be a romp, you know, through through Vietnam, <laughs> uh, through even the fact that I was a Vietnam vet. And then after the first couple of weeks, everybody realized, uh oh, you know, we. <laughs> <laughs> we signed on to something here uh, because my whole approach is focusing on how various cultural forms, especially film, rework the memory of of, uh, of the Vietnam War. So there, the whole thing is uh, super saturated with uh, uh, critical analysis. Uh, but the the uh, reactions, student reactions, have really changed over the years. This is a course that I have taught for about 20 years. And uh, initially, uh, it was uh, 
you know, uh, fraternity guys looking for an easy A and uh, having a good time uh, doing it. And then as that evolved, uh, a, a different kind of student began turning up in the class who really was very, very interested in the history of uh, the war and used uh, the course as a way to figure that out. And in addition to that, many uh, students started turning up in the class whose uh, parents, one way or another, had had uh, been involved in the war, e either as uh, soldiers or as uh, you know loved ones back home, or anti-war activists. Some of whom uh, went up to Canada, and uh, so their children uh, were using this class to try to figure out <laughs> why their parents were so screwed up. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, now I, I, I think whenever whenever I teach this course, it's uh, more like a, uh, a cautionary tale, uh, particularly given the fact that now we we have gone through close to two generations uh, of uh, people uh, not being required to put on the uniform. So so now there's this sense that military experience is rather exotic. You know, um, and uh, and really, for the vast majority of Americans, it truly is. You know, be, uh, because the uh, connections with people in uniform now are so uh, so relatively small. Yeah. So I uh, I think that's been the uh, the uh, evolutionary uh, development. And, and and of course, for many young people today, uh, the Vietnam War might as well be the the war in the Crimea uh, or the Spanish American War. You know, it's ancient. <laughs> It's all ancient history. <laughs> Young people. Yeah, if it, if it happened before I was born, uh, it it didn't happen. That seems to be the mindset of a lot of a lot. Well, of one of the things people. I like to tell young people, and I get away with this now because I'm, uh, you know, I have entered my grandfatherly role. I think, <laughs> with, uh, with, a, with with a lot of uh, youngsters, I tell them, you know, listen, we couldn't wait for you. There there was a lot we needed to do before you got here, but now that you're here, it's all good. Yeah. Uh, but that's indicative of uh, all of Kubrick's films in a way, I think. And I'm ta talking about the general public's embrace of the film. Uh, that it, I feel it has evolved over time. Uh, and that happens with all of his films. People don't quite get it at first. And then years pass and they start to pick up on it. Um, and Full Metal Jacket had the misfortune of, of being released on the heels of Platoon, which was this major phenomenon um when when you kind of contrast the two what what are the major differences that you see well i uh um i love platoon uh for for many reasons um I, and i think a lot of it comes down to the fact that i was in a medical unit and uh didn't see a whole lot of damaged uh people uh, but i did see a few and i think oliver stone uh gets that really well the the uh, the representation of death uh, in combat uh, really achieved a whole new level in platoon, and I th I think we all recognize that. Um, the uh, in in addition to that, the uh, for me one of the things that platoon captures is the split uh, along uh, racial lines, social class lines, even regional lines. Uh, I'm sure that many people listening to this will uh, remember the two hooches, the, the the hooch where the sort of the redneck Southern boys hang out and drink, mm -hmm. and the other hooch where the uh, potheads and the snack freaks and God knows who else uh, hang out. By the way, that was my hooch in in Vietnam. The Willem mm. Dafoe hooch <laughs> was the uh, was my hooch. The uh, uh, Oliver Stone gets that really really well. And uh, the the uh, the other thing that I'll say about Platoon is that uh, there is that sequence where the village is wasted. You know, the civilians are are murdered. War atrocity. It's a war mm -hmm. atrocity. And and what Oliver Stone does in that scene is not make it palatable, of course, but plausible. He makes right. it plausible. He identifies the the psychotic element of such uh, action and makes it understandable. And I think that's one reason why it creeps people out uh, so so much. 
Uh-huh. And this and this is something that you mentioned before about the whole the motivation of of uh, of a young GI coming into the the war as a as a means of kind of becoming a man. Uh, and and that was Oliver Stone's story, and that's the story of Platoon as well. Yeah, the uh, Platoon is uh, uh, everybody knows it's very autobiographical. Uh, the Charlie Sheen character is pretty much uh, Oliver Stone, and uh, the Charlie Sheen character uh, goes through a a transformation, the likes of which uh, probably has never been achieved in a combat film, mm. uh, other than uh, Lou Ayers and uh, All Quiet on the Western Front, although that film is certainly not nearly as graphic uh, in the representation of death as uh, Oliver Stone's film. I, I think what Oliver Stone uh, offers up is a a requiem. You know, it's a uh, homage to the dead. Mm-hmm. And uh, e- even the uh, recurring uh, adagio, you know, Barber's uh, adagio, uh, emphasizes that. And uh, some some people may recall that it was precisely that uh, bit of music that was played by the New York Philharmonic on the night that uh, John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, mm. So that that uh, that bit of music, that recurring music in reference to the dead, is uh, something that is very much a part of the era itself. And uh, I, I I think Stone strategically uses it to to uh, Remind us that uh, you know a lot of good people, a lot of bad people as well. Frankly, certainly a lot of Americans lost their lives in Vietnam, and uh, the the significance of that may be lost on very young people. Remember, for a long period of time, the dead, the the our de- the American dead, uh, were uh, pretty much uh, swept under the rug in in this yeah. culture. Certainly, no politician wanted to have anything to do with Vietnam vets, uh, except for a few of the vets who uh, made themselves available for, uh, uh, you know, special treatment as far as I'm concerned. Uh, For a long time, this culture avoided what I call the final taboo of the Vietnam War, and that's the fact that so many Americans died there. And it was the introduction of the memorial, the wall in Washington, that opened up all of this space for other uh, artistic expressions to to try to deal uh, with that issue and to try to to uh, discover some kind of meaning, some kind of acceptable meaning uh, for our losses there. Well, I, I, that brings me to to Stone's next film, and I, I just I'll ask you about this, and then I'll, I'll let you go. You've been so generous with your time, but uh, I definitely want to get your take on this film because. Uh, I remember <clears throat> seeing this. I remember the day I saw it, January first, nineteen ninety, <laughs> and because I've I've never been so deeply moved by a film. I mean, it was the first movie that really just knocked me out, and that was Born on the Fourth of July. And, and yeah. from your particular experience, I'm wondering what your take on that film was. Uh, well, that film also is uh, uh, very biographical, of course, and uh, I mean, it really is based on the autobiography of. Uh, Gosh, I had forgotten. Ron Kovic, yeah. Yeah, Ron. All right, Ron. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I don't I don't think Tom Cruise has ever been better in mm-hmm. in a film. I mean that I mean that was just an ext- uh, extraordinary uh, achievement. And uh, I that was you know as an anti-war GI, you know, uh, I I have to say that that really was the that that was the best anti-war. Statement that I had seen on the screen, um, and uh, it, uh, I think it, it is. Uh, I think another film comes close to that, and that's the uh, Coming Home film. You know, John mm-hmm. Boy and uh, Jane Fonda, which I think is a really a fine film. Um, the I I'm not quite sure what else I can say about but it, but uh, it Born, speaks, on, it's, Born on the Fourth of July. It speaks to that reaction that you were talking about when when they when the veteran came home yeah. and uh, the kind of the public denial and, and the resistance of, of, of dealing respectfully with with the veteran uh, it kind of brings that to the forefront in a special way, I think. 
Um, I, w- one of the things that, uh, that that film taps into is the same kind of thing that a lot of the war poetry written by combat veterans tapped into very early on, and, and that was uh, this message. You share culpability in mm. what happened in Vietnam. And by you, I mean the civilian population. The the, uh, uh, the Vietnam veteran, of course, for a long period of time, bore uh, all of the craziness of the, the post-war period. Uh, all of that was uh, that was put on our shoulders. Uh, I, uh, I think what the what Born on the Fourth uh, of July does, in a way very similar to much of the powerful uh, poetry that came out of that war is basically uh, tell the entire uh, American population, no, 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 not just us. You, too, are mm-hmm. implicated in what happened in Vietnam. So you don't get off the hook. 